Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, Montgomery County Council passes racial equity bill. What does it hope to accomplish? County Executive Mark Elrich seeks legalizing the sale of marijuana to fund education. The contest to replace Elijah Cummings begins to take shape. And is the impeachment inquiry winning over undecided Americans? Stay tuned. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by the former mayor of Rockville, Susan Hoffman. Secretary of the Maryland Republican Party, Mark Hunkifer. President of the Chevy Chase Women's Republican Club, Lori Halverson. And political strategist, Susan Heltmus. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. This week, the County Council unanimously enacted the Racial Equity and Social Justice Act for the purpose of institutionalizing the norms of racial equity and social justice into the work of the county government. Susan Hoffman, the premise for passing the RESJA is that given our nation's history of genocide, slavery, and equitable life and outcomes based on race, it's imperative that government incorporate a racial equity lens and bring a commitment to racial justice into how government works. Now, my question for you is, is it possible for government to stipulate equal opportunity and to eliminate inequality? I would say that, first of all, this bill is aspirational and inspirational. And I think that the government should be the place that certainly seeks to deal with the stain of racial inequality and genocide and, and our history, our unfortunate history. But are you in saying that as a county realm. and Excuse as a state? Excuse me one second, I'd like to finish. And therefore, in this time of, of uh, Mr. Trump and uh, his embrace of white supremacy, we need this now more than ever. All right, well, I want to ask a question. Are you, but are you saying that as a county and a state, we have institutional racism in Montgomery County what, and in the state of Maryland? What I'm saying is there is, there is racism at every level and anything we can do to eliminate it what, what and is this going to mitigate do specifically? it and mitigate it is a good thing. What she said is that it's aspirational, inspirational. I think that you can't stipulate, but this is a nice plan. And I think what we can say is the government can stimulate racial equity. How? Well, uh, How? they're talking about when master plans go through, when new policies go through in county government, that you look at factors to make certain, you know, that there is a, you know, stimulus to get, for instance, more minorities in programs or more people in Isn't jobs. Isn't that being done already, Susan? No, it's not being done in a... We, we, we've had... In we've, a it has not effort. been. It's not being done in a structured way. There, there are efforts all the time, and if it were being done, and if there were a commission that dealt with this, they, this, this act also establishes. I thought, I thought there was a civil rights commission. Mark, Heather <laughs> McDonald, who is with the, the Man Manhattan Institute, writes. You're that, so dismissive it, of this. No I'm, no, I'm not. I'm just wondering what they you hope to accomplish. You just said I thought there was a commission. There is a civil rights civil commission. rights commission. Well, the civil rights commission does not focus on just on social I think justice it's human equity relations, actually. in in um, all legislation. And now we're going to be looking at legislation through that lens. Thank and you. And planning. And Mark Heather McDonald. There is a contrary view, and Heather McDonald, who writes for the Manhattan Institute, says that identity politics makes government more polarized by teaching Americans to hate each other. And that disparate impact analysis focusing on policy outcomes rather than intentions should be eradicated. Racial preferences should be eliminated from government hiring and contracting. So obviously, that's the opposite view. Where should we find ourselves in this debate? You know, hopefully not hating each other. But I do think identity politics uh, does divide people. Uh, where we've had preferences in the past, it's had been limited to where there was a specific history of discrimination, where you could point to an occupation or a hiring practice and you were doing it as a remedial measure. This Montgomery County action is so amorphous, 
it's not clear. What I would ask you, Susan, is so if, if there's a choice between one person and another person, is, is that what you're prepared to do? Are we making, picking loser, winners and losers based on this, this, this initiative? So I am not an expert in this bill, obviously, but the way I read the act, it is not necessarily remedial. Again, it's aspirational. And um, in fact, there's not even um, a price tag yet placed on what on the cost of this of this uh, legislation, and so that's something that they're going to need to deal with as well. Well, I think our federal government provides, you know, for all of us, it provides equity for all of us, and I'm concerned that this legislation is going to provide a situation where you're going to have, in the name of diversity, you're going to have discrimination. Um, and I'm, that's you know, it's about. worth noting that after the Civil War, we passed the 14th and 15th of the amendments that came to the Constitution that have provided a legal framework in order to address many of the, the issues that have been, uh, where there, there has been discrimination. Well, I can think of an issue right now that would, could be impacted, and that is a 12th center for early voting. And the African American community says that in the White Oak area there is a big mass of poor African American black minorities who don't necessarily have uh, their own transportation and that they need public transit to get to voting. And so uh, there, as opposed to, you know, a area they're talking about is in North Potomac. And so this is one of those where so, you might look at it and but say... But you don't think government... I mean, these, this issue is, is before the Board of Elections. You don't think the Board of Elections is taking into consideration the proper location for a, an early voting point. Well, what the Board this of is Elections a, position concern, Susan, right now is money. We've got to go on money. to our next step. Is money. My <laughs> concern is that this is ill-defined, and all, there, are, there, are, there are checks already in place to address these issues. I, would I, want, to go, I want to go on to <laughs> the next topic, which is, I think, a, a very important topic, which is about the legalization of marijuana. Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich suggested that the state should legalize and control the sale of marijuana to help fund education. What do you think about that? You know that movie, It's a Wonderful Life, um, and there's Pottersville. I, have you all seen that movie? It's one of my favorite movies at this, this time of the year. Well, I'm worried that uh, County Executive Elrich is like Mr. Potter, and we don't have a, um, a George Bailey anywhere around to help protect um, what's going on. And so I feel like we're going to have legal, we've had legalization of, of, um, of gambling, now legalization of marijuana, and what's next? We're gonna, the next thing is going to be legalization of prostitution. Who knows? Uh, so that's, you know, I, so I think, I think of Pottersville that we're going that direction and we need a George Bailey to help, help us out. Susan Heltimus, a recent poll concluded that 62% of all Americans support the legalization of marijuana despite the fact that marijuana has mind-altering compounds and affects your brain and body, can be addictive and harmful. Why is this a good proposition for the, for the county government to take up? Well, first of all, the county government won't take it up. It's a state issue. And secondly, uh, the state is not going to be dealing with it at least this, is, it, this year because there are some George Baileys out there who are concerned that this is an entryway, gate entry drug and that there are real issues. And one of the issues that I think is going to take up a lot of time and energy, and that is the control. I've been in conversations with the police department and the liquor department and a whole lot of other people like, how will this be? Who's going to control it? How right. do you measure it? And it's so it's going it's a ways off. And I think it is something that, you know, the county, it's something that Mark Elrich probably should not have said, let the state deal with it. And at that point, deal with where the money should go if right. it were to happen. But okay, it's not going to happen soon. Well, we're going to go to our final topic in this segment. Susan Hoffman, have you filed your candidacy papers for the <laughs> vacant seat uh, caused by the death of Congressman Elijah Cummings? Well, if you haven't, there are 29 others who have. And on the, on the Democratic side are Maya Rocky Moore Cummings and former Congressman Kwiazi Mfume. Who is the front runner? So in, in answer to your first question, no, I have not filed um, my... Could, uh, I could, I could. You don't have to live in the district, you just have to live in the state. But no, I'm not going to run for that, that uh, position. Um, as of today, 
I would, um, and, and based on my research, Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings and Kwasim Fume are pretty much neck and neck and are front runners. I would, well, there's a lot of there, people. There is, there's a Republicans that are running, Mark. Right. Who are the Republicans that are, that are running? Well, and we only have about 30 seconds. I was going to say, Liz Matori is certainly someone who we know who is running. But I, I hate to break the format, but I agree in this one occasion <laughs> that Susan may be right in terms of who the front Then there are 32 the, people. And you have, and you have the, the last word. Oh, Thank you, Mark. Media. <laughs> Not Susan has the last shout, <laughs> yep. and you have the last word. When we come back from this short break, did Gordon Sunderland's testimony provide the ammunition for Democrats to go forward with impeachment, or was his testimony full of blanks? Stay tuned. <laughs> Two weeks into the impeachment inquiry, Americans seem as divided as ever. A survey conducted by NPR concluded that only half of the Americans approve of impeachment inquiry. And more revealing is that 65% of Americans say that they can't imagine any information or circumstances during the impeachment inquiry might change their minds. Susan Hoffman, CNN, reports that in a private meeting this week, top Democrats conceded that their basic message is failing to break through to huge swaths of Americans. So why are Americans not paying attention to the impeachment effort? Well, I think the premise that you're stating is, is a little um, skewed. Uh, it's not that they're not breaking through. It's that people are pretty much locked in. And as, as the latest uh, expression, it's baked in. Um, so there are 47 percent of the population that support impeachment. There are 44 percent that, that do not support impeachment. And there's not a lot coming down the pike that is changing anybody's mind. If you're anti-Trump, you're anti-Trump. If you're pro-Trump, you're pro-Trump. And that's unfortunate. The reason that people aren't watching is because it's during the day and everybody has to earn a living. Right. So Susan Heltimus, Congressman Schiff, claims that Gordon Sunderland provided the smoking gun to impeach the president. Yet when Congressman Mike Turner questioned Sunderland whether anyone, anyone on this planet, including Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, Mick Mulvaney, Mike Pompeo, Donald Duck, told him that aid to Ukraine was tied to political investigation, Sondland did a yabba dabba do like Fred Flintstone and replied that no one ever told him of linkage between aid and a political investigation. So with such conflicting testimony, isn't this impeachment effort just political theater? No, it isn't. And um, we have had incredible, um, articulate, well-informed people telling us the facts. And Sondland, this was his third time. You know, he gave testimony, he revised it, he's back again. Um, the facts are there. Whether you believe that's impeachable is the question. But, you know, uh, Richard Nixon was going to be impeached, and he had the good sense to resign. Susan, wanna, Wait a minute, a over a break-in that failed. You know, Trump changed his tune after it was announced that there was a report that had come out. The guy did it. It's to improve himself. So I, I'm not sure what he did, but I think what both you and Susan Hoffman have just confirmed is that if you're a Democrat, you believe and you see the facts one way, but if you are a Republican, you're and you're see, blind and deaf and dumb. That's your that's your see, opinion, Susan. No, wait, Susan. But Susan, that's, I mean, that's you know, you that know, is you know what, your I'm opinion. saying it's that is Republicans the Republicans are not giving a chance Susan, to Susan, even listen. This is they walked out yesterday, and they, when they realized they weren't getting anywhere, they walked out and gave up. They don't want to hear the truth. And the thing is, is that they should just listen and give it a chance. And I think it's closer to like... Susan, this is, this is your Jack Nicholson moment. You can't <laughs> handle the truth. Because the fact is that ne neither party wants to hear what the other party... No, what the that's other party absolutely is. not yeah, true. And this is why I want to address with Mark this next question. Sure. It's, be it's because I think that the dialogue that we have seen over the last three years has been so divisive to our country. And it is turning us into opponents of one another. And it's really unfortunate. Mark, when uh, Attorney General Barr spoke at the Federalist Society, he gave this warning. He said, immediately after President Trump won the election, opponents inaugurated what was called the resistance. 
It obviously connotes that the government is not legitimate. What it means is instead of viewing themselves as the loyal opposition, as opposing parties have done in the past, they essentially see themselves engaged in a war to cripple by any means necessary an elected, duly elected government. This is the question. Are we on the road to becoming a third world country where domestic politics is like Philippines or Argentina? I will certainly hope not, but I think you're right on to a point that the day after President Trump was inaugurated, there were hundreds of thousands of people who were prepared to impeach him then. And millions and then, no, marching. No, the, and, and, and exactly, what we're talking about, millions marching. And we heard for a year and a half that the evidence was right around the corner, that Mueller would have the goods. And you know what? Mueller isn't really figuring into this impeachment process. And so now we have another set of accusations without evidence. What we do is we regularly hear people's theories about what somebody else may have said. What we have is a complete lack of evidence that would be something you would take into court. And let, me, let me take this to Lori, because I think it's only fair to hear from the other Republican on the panel. And this is a different perspective. The third Republican on the panel. Comedian <laughs> Bill Mayer said this in a monologue. Lately, we've been hearing more and more about a second civil war, which sounds impossible in this modern, affluent country. It's not we talk about Trump as an existential threat, but his side sees democratic control of government the exact same way. When both sides believe the other guy t taking over means the end of the world, yes, it can mean a civil war. Is Bill Maher right, or is this just hyperinflated rhetoric around the impeachment? Yeah, I um, I don't watch any of the talk show hosts anymore, um, except when I see when an article like this comes out, and then I watch the video. Um, I was shocked at how he talks. He is so crass, and so um, he used so many expletives in his his video that, about this issue. I was like, okay, he's talking about Trump, and he's sounding a lot worse than Trump. And, and he's feeding to the fire of all the liberals and giving them what they want to see. And I just um, was really taken aback by that. And, and really, the, his main message was not really about civil war. It was let it go. But he wasn't talking about respecting uh, um, Republicans. He was talking about, um, he, he called. Just, what he was saying, was saying is that just you have to tolerate them. I, yeah, yeah, and he said what? that we, we were, got, we got he, we got he called this. us we have haters, to, and he called us this anti uh, but, I th um, but again, the point that I wanted to make throughout this <laughs> is that we are, we are in a dangerous time yeah. where if we don't start respecting one another and listening to one another and accepting one's point of view, whether you agree or not, we are, we are in for a very bad time. Casey, Stay tuned for Parting Shots. And welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Susan Helfness. Um, this last Sunday I was um, pleased to be a part of a program where Casey Aiken was introduced, inducted rather, into the Montgomery County Community Media Hall of Fame. The MCM Hall of Fame is the highest honor of our access user community. The inductees demonstrate the greatest dedication to community-created programming and volunteerism. Ladies and gentlemen, MCM's 2019 Hall of Fame inductee is Casey Aiken. It's a wonderful honor. It's a, such an important voice for Montgomery County and the state of Maryland to have a voice where people can come and talk about the politics, they can talk about the social goings that are, that are happening, and it's, it's great to have that, that voice in that medium. I'm honored to have a wonderful group of guests they make the show. They are the ones that interact act with one another. You saw Susan Helfness on the, on the screen. Susan and I met at Leadership Montgomery in the class of 2000, the greatest class of all, of course. And uh, Susan immediately uh, and I became friends when she came up to me and handed me a voter registration card to change from a, from a Republican to a Democrat. <laughs> but the wonderful thing is we have a great group of panels panelists and they give up and they sacrifice their time. It takes a lot to come here every Friday night to, t to uh, tape a show for, for an hour and a half and to give up their time and because they're passionate about the politics of the county.
But again, I want to wrap it up and I thank everyone because I'm passionate about Montgomery County, our life in Montgomery County, and what makes Montgomery County a better place for our future. So thank you so much. Twenty years later, almost 20 years later, Casey and I still disagree about everything imaginable, uh, except we both like pizza. But anyway, I am very happy for you, Casey. Uh, your family was here, and um, you didn't thank your family, but they give up a lot every Friday night when you come in here. So, Casey, job well done, well earned, and here's to the next 20 years or whatever. Well, well thank you, Susan. I'm, and I. I, and I appreciate that um, that uh, little uh, film clip that was shown. Uh, it's amazing how time has flown. It's been a wonderful honor to host this show because I do believe in the civic involvement for Montgomery County and for all of us is the most important thing. But now with their part, their own parting shots, Lori Halverson. Yes, a couple celebrities were in the news this week. Uh, one of them is Kanye West, who has done a total 180 and has got a new tour about Jesus, Jesus is King tour. Uh, so I just want to give him a shout out saying I think that's a good thing because I think a lot of people uh, are listening to him and getting a good message. The other uh, group is Coldplay, and they have decided not to do a tour um, because they want, they're concerned about their, their carbon footprint. Uh, they want to hold off, off their tour until they can be carbon neutral. So I have an idea. If they can uh, just grow a bunch of trees, that can help them be carbon neutral, and then they can tour again. So, right. Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Mark Uncafer, your party shot, please. You know, Susan is wrong about a great many things, and we don't <laughs> agree on a great many things, but I have to say on the parting shot, I absolutely agree. I want to associate myself with, with your remarks. First time ever, right? Not quite, but uh, it's, not, it's an occasion, uh, and uh, I enjoyed uh, being at the uh, event where uh, Casey was inducted into uh, the Hall of Fame, and I just kind of want to share your observation about uh, how appropriate it was. And he got this big, beautiful pen. Yeah, pin. it's <laughs> almost like the size of a medium pizza. Um, but I want to, this, this program should be bookmarked for everybody who watches because Mark has agreed not only with Susan Hoffman tonight, but also with Susan <laughs> Ultimus tonight. I'll bring you a <laughs> change now, of registration card next week. And now week. for her Good party shot, that. <laughs> Susan Hoffman. <laughs> So I think that um, our viewers know that uh, we videotape in advance, and um, actually today we're videotaping on November 22nd, and this is uh, the 56th anniversary of one of the darkest days in the history of, of the United States, and, and one that is indelibly impressed in, in my psyche, and that is the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. Um, and our country's never been quite the same. Um, we, we laugh again and we love him and we admire him, um, but uh, we miss him terribly. And um, I think we should stop for a moment and think about that. And also I want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Susan. Uh, in, in picking up with the spirit of anniversaries, I, I also want to point out that this is the 156th anniversary, or three days ago, it was the 156th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And it's a short, it is a very short statement, but a beautiful statement to the trials and tribulations that occurred during the Civil War. What's very important and relate, can relate to us today is that Lincoln understood the sacrifice that both sides were giving as uh, uh, on the battlefield and they wanted to make sure that we remained strong as a nation. The, the, the civil strife that we're experiencing today as we talked about the impeachment of President Trump is also a reminder that we are always Americans and we need to remind ourselves that we are unified. We can, cannot be defeated, but we can be defeated from within. Now, since Thanksgiving is next week, I want to offer my thanks publicly today. I want to thank the crew who worked tirelessly to make this the best political talk show anywhere, not just in Montgomery County, but anywhere. I want to thank the panelists who give their time each week to making Montgomery County a better place to live, and I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show. For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>